Good morning, you guys. Um, so good to see you guys. Um, to begin this morning, I just wanted to share a couple announcements with y'all with you guys. So the first one being, if you look up at our screen, um, we are transitioning from push pay to secure give. You can also take a seat. I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're transitioning from secure pay to push pay to secure give for um, the system that you guys can give and tithe to. And so if you give online, you can still go to our website and click the link there, um, as well as use the link on our app. And so it'll take you to a new place. Um, you may need to create an account um, if you want to give, or you can give as a guest if you prefer that. So that is the transition we're making. If you already have had automated giving set up in the past, um, you should have received details about this via email or um, a physical letter this past week. But if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to our office or send a message to finance at brainerdbaptist.org. Um, and so that's the finance piece. And secondly, this coming week, we are going to be welcoming Dr. Chuck Lawless um, just to come and teach on discipling the church. So we have some spots open for our weeknight class that we're going to be doing this week. It'll be Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Are interested on just digging into the word about this topic, you're more than welcome to come. It's open for everybody. So we would love to have you. Um, if you want more information or to register, you can do that by going to our website, so brainerdbaptist.org forward slash events. Um, so we would love to see you there. If you can register by tomorrow at midnight, you can also have dinner provided for you. Um, so lastly, we are super excited to host our women's ministry annual kickoff September 16th, and it'll be in this room. So ladies, if you come, you're going to be introduced to uh, the topic and the theme for this year, which is dwell. And you'll also learn how to get involved in some Bible studies that they'll be doing through the book of First John. There'll be six week studies and they're going to begin in October. So if you want more information about that or to sign up for that, you can also go to the same events page brainerdbaptist.org forward slash events. Um, so that are, those are the announcements that we have, but also I wanted to introduce our missions moment that we're going to have this morning. So um, with that, it's going to be about coffee. So if you know me, you know that I love coffee and it's not just any kind of coffee. It's coffee with a mission and with a purpose. Um, thanks to Phoenix Roasters in Atlanta. You may have heard of them in the past year. We've used them a little bit. Um, but we just wanted to share a little bit about what they do. So these coffee guys are not just coffee guys. They're also church planters in the Atlanta area, and they've planted house-sized churches in their area in the past. And so not only that, but the coffee side of what they do, they partner with coffee bean farmers that are also church planters. Pretty cool. Um, and so with that, they align with our mission as Brainerd to help those who are far from God become committed followers of Christ from the scenic city to the nations, which is really, really beautiful and awesome. Um, so their coffee is fair trade. So these guys have a role in ensuring the sustainable livelihoods of these coffee bean farmers, as well as relationships with them, which in turn, they get to share the good news. So um, it's really great. And we're sharing this just because next week, we're going to start partnering with Phoenix Roasters to provide this coffee on a Sunday morning on each Sunday morning at each of our campuses and our venues. So because of that, we just wanted you guys to know that you were taking part in this mission and that when you're sipping on that coffee in your service, um, that there is kingdom purpose to that coffee. And I think that that is beautiful. And you guys should know that and um, be able to lean into that. So let me pray for us. And then we're going to transition into the mission moment. Lord, thank you so much um, for this morning and just letting us come together and gather and you, Lord, and hear about your word. Um, I just want to pray for what is given today and that you use it for your glory and for your kingdom and that you, Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see um, your goodness and your glory and the message and in just what we are doing in our community um, and how you're, you're just so big and you're so magnificent, Lord, that you're um, for your glory alone. Um, help us to just uh, surrender everything, Lord.
Well, in the beginning, it was three former student pastors that were part of planning a church. We were looking for a way to help ourselves as far as resources and income. All Feet came up out of that. And once that happened, our lives were changed forever. We realized you can drink coffee black. And we started learning and discovering more that with God, there's no box. He introduced us to farmers as we went down God's path for our life. Well, basically, we have three simple ways of purchasing coffee. Who are we going to buy coffee from? You know, what is it that the farmer's already doing locally? You know, what are they doing in their own town? What are they doing in their own vision for their family and their country? We direct trade with our farmers, and so what they get through that relationship, not only just emotionally and spiritually, they become our family and friends and brothers in Christ. Even these farmers that are in the mountains of these Latin countries are partnering with us in planting churches here in Atlanta. Taste would be the second word, and so we expect you to buy the coffee again. If it doesn't taste good, you won't buy it a second time, and so taste is very important. We have five different coffees in our nitro line. That process of mixing the nitrogen and the coffee product makes the buttery, creamy texture, makes that micro bubble head that makes the product taste even better. And then thirdly is price. We definitely pay between 10 and 15 times more fair trade. All of our people have a story. And as you get to know each other's story, you want what you do to be the best it can be. And so our whole business is deeply connected in relationships. By doing that, everybody gets a great cup of coffee. Well, good morning, Brainerd Faith family and guests. It's great to see you on this Labor Day weekend. So glad you're here. I want us to study God's Word together in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9 in your Bible. As you're turning there, let me just say I can't tell you how excited I am to know that coffee is part of God's mission. Uh, That uh, encourages me greatly. I didn't know I had been on mission all of these years, uh, all day long, drinking coffee, but course that's not uh, uh, that's not the missional element but uh, it's it's been it's been cool to see I was, you know, I've been in a number of different countries um, training pastors and sharing the gospel and had the opportunity to meet uh, with uh, some missionaries uh, in different places that that was their platform uh, they, they grew coffee and um, roasted it and uh, Uh, made it available, but using that as a vehicle uh, to be able to share the gospel and be in a particular place that they might not otherwise be able to be in. Uh, And so it's really, really cool to see how God has has used that. Mark chapter 9 in your Bible, uh, I want us to jump back into this narrative this morning, and I want to begin reading over you, beginning in verse 30. In Mark chapter 9, Mark is the human author, of course, uh, but he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, so that makes this God's Word uh, for us. And this is what it says, Mark chapter 9, verse 30. They went on from there, of course, they being Jesus and his disciples, uh, just leaving the Mount of Transfiguration and the encounter with this crowd and uh, father of this demon-possessed boy at the foot of the mountain. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and he was in the house. He, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. 
And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, we, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Probably most of you are familiar with the concept of the GOAT. I'm not talking about uh, the animal, but uh, the acronym GOAT that's uh, usually part of our athletic discussions. Uh, it's an acronym that just simply stands for the greatest of all time, G-O-A-T. That conversation goes along, a lot, on a lot in the sports world. I've mentioned this before in some messages because it has so many parallels to things that we run across in Scripture. It's interesting to me to see the nature of the arguments about who is the greatest of all time in, in, in particular uh, uh, athletic disciplines, in particular sports. One of the things that's so ironic to me about that is it's like, okay, how do you know? Even if you, if you are able to look at a particular athlete in a particular setting and compare it to every person that has come before that one and come to the conclusion, if you could, that, okay, this person is the greatest of everybody that's ever played this sport, how do you know what's going to come after uh, how do you know uh, who's going to be born in the next generation? Who's the next five-star athlete in high school that's going to come up who could end up being better? How do you make the assessment that someone is the greatest of all time, assuming that all time includes not only the past, but includes the future? But the thing, the thing that is that is most troubling to me about the conversation, even though we all have our opinions in different areas, whether it's sports or entertainment or, you know, uh, uh, other, other things that we encounter in life, that the things that, that, that is most disturbing to me is the claim by an individual that they are the greatest of all time. There's just something that's unsettling about that. Something that just doesn't seem right. Maybe Muhammad Ali was the first in 1974 after he beat George Foreman in a boxing match who said he was, he claimed to be the greatest of all time. Most recently, in, you know, in, in our day and time, just a couple of years ago, LeBron James reflecting back on the Cleveland Cavaliers 2016 World Championship uh, claimed to be the greatest of all time. He said it was that series that helped me to realize I am the greatest of, of all time. Now, it's, it's happened as an accolade for other uh, individuals in sports by other people. There are those, though I don't think she's ever said it, that have said Serena Williams is the best tennis player of, uh, of all time. Tom Brady, of course, has been called the greatest of all time as far as football quarterbacks are concerned. But, but, but when someone makes the claim themselves, there, there's something that, that doesn't fit. But I know when I look at that, when I look at that as an outsider, it's easy for me to say. But when I get alone in the quietness of my own heart before God, I know, though I, I don't know that I could see myself ever saying that, there is part of my flesh that longs for that. In fact, it's true of you. It's true of every single one of us. It's part of our depraved nature 
And whether it plays out in a, in a blatant, articulated claim that I am the greatest of all time, there, 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 there is sometimes, maybe most of the time, this unarticulated, unverbalized desire to, to be better than someone else, to see ourselves as better than someone else. Jesus will tell us in this passage of Scripture, there's really not anything more contrary to the gospel than that. That's what this passage of Scripture is about. I, I want you to think about it in terms of the larger context. If we're going if we, if to put a big idea to this, it would be very similar to some of the things that you know, have gone before this as Jesus has begun to teach his disciples about what's about to happen to him. And so we might say it like this, the suffering servant, that is Jesus, Jesus the suffering servant calls on his followers to deny themselves and follow him. That's big picture, that's general. What's going on here is deeper than that, it is more specific. What's happening in this passage of Scripture is that suffering servant, the one who is headed to the cross to die, and, and, and that's communicated again in this passage of Scripture, calls upon his followers to, to die to self by, by, by demonstrating humble service a, 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 as well as gracious receptivity to other believers in him. Now, I want us to think about that idea from several different standpoints, really a progression, a development in this passage of Scripture. I want to, I want to show you these, these truths, these realities. I want, I want you to look at the motive of the gospel in this passage of Scripture because this is what drives this, okay? This is what makes the economy in the Christian church and the Christian life different from whatever the world is doing. Whatever the world's pursuits are, the thing that makes the difference is the gospel. So we're going to start with that. We're going to start with the motive of the gospel. But I want you to then see where the motive of the gospel leads. The motive of the gospel leads to a new meaning of greatness. And so that's the second thing we're going to see the meaning of greatness, greatness that Jesus puts on the table. But Jesus is not done. That new meaning, that different meaning of greatness in this passage of Scripture leads to a particular kind of ministry that you and I have to one another and to other believers in Christ, and that is a ministry of graciousness. So, so those are the, the three big categories, the motive of the gospel, the meaning of greatness, and the ministry of of graciousness. So let me show them to you. Let's start with the motive of the gospel. This is the thing that's driving it. This is the second time in two chapters, <laughs> but it's the second time in, in, in Jesus' ministry as recorded in gospel, the, the gospel of Mark that he, he begins to teach his disciples about what's ahead. And that is that he's going to the cross to die and he's going to rise again after three days. So, so, so we look and we're introduced in verse 30 really to just as kind of a reminder, we've seen this before, of the mission Jesus is on. It says they went on from there and passed through Galilee. I'll get your geography straight. They've been up near Caesarea Philippi. We don't know exactly where the Mount of Transfet Mountain that the Transfiguration took place is, but we know it was up there somewhere. Now Jesus is beginning to move back south and he's moving back into Galilee, but understand this. He's not moving back into Galilee to do ministry, to work more miracles, to proclaim the gospel. He's done with that. It's just that Galilee is in between where he's been up north in Gentile territory and Jerusalem down in the south, and that's where he's headed. Everything in Mark's gospel in, in, in these last chapters after chapter 8 is headed in that direction. That's where Jesus is going because that is the mission that he is on. That's why he came. And now he's headed back through Galilee, going down to Jerusalem where he will die. Now along the way, and we've, we've seen this already, there's, there, is a, there is another part of his mission that is happening, and that is intentional training of his disciples. 
He's taking them to school. This is kind of a mobile seminar. This whole thing, ever since he came out of Galilee uh, the first time, a number of chapters before, went out into Gentile territory. He really, yes, he's been doing miracles. He's been teaching. But the primary focus was this laboratory, getting these disciples ready, getting them ready, not just for his death and resurrection, but for their mission of continuing gospel advancement after he was already gone, after he had ascended back into heaven. So that's what's going on here. Jesus is training his disciples. So he's on this mission, big picture, to go to Jerusalem to die. Secondarily, though, getting his disciples ready. That's why it says he passed through Galilee, and he didn't want anyone to know. He's not making a big deal of this. Why? Because he's focused on his disciples. And it says, for he was teaching his disciples. So, so those are the, that's the mission Jesus on. But I want you to notice the message, the lesson that he has for them. Look in verse 31. He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Now, again, this is the second time that we've seen in, that Jesus has, is in. he's going to do it three times. Once in chapter 8, really the same verse, verse 31, if you go back there and we saw it, that's what he began to do to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. That's chapter 8, verse 31. That's where Peter, you know, Peter pushes back. We're not going to let that happen to you. Why? Because the disciples' concept of the Messiah is still a bit perverted, they're still looking for a political leader. They're still looking for a military conqueror. They're still looking for someone to overthrow the Romans, defeat their enemies, reestablish Israel to, to their place as the people of God and the greatest nation on the planet. The disciples, even though they believe Jesus is the guy, they, they're still thinking in that direction. That's what was happening in chapter 8. Same thing is happening here. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. Really interesting, this word translated delivered in verse 31 in my English text. In some English translations, it's actually translated betrayed, and it can mean that. And, and, and when it's translated betrayed, it reflects the idea of what's going to happen physically by way of Judas. Judas is going to betray Jesus and hand him over, if you will, to the, the officials. The, the officials, the religious leaders are going to betray him. They're going to hand him over to Pilate. Pilate's going to betray him. He's going to hand him over to, you know, to, you know, to be killed. You've got all of this going on that is going to happen that does reflect the idea of betrayal. But the word actually means just, it, it means to hand over as somebody is being handed over for imprisonment, for arrest, something of that nature. And it's, it's interesting, we haven't been introduced yet to the idea of one of Jesus' own betraying him. That, that comes a little bit later. Because I don't think that's exactly what Jesus is, is talking about. Number one, in the language of the New Testament, this is a word in the tense uh, that, that means a, an ongoing activity. It's already happening. Essentially, Jesus was saying the Son of Man is already being handed over into the hands of men. We probably help the most by thinking ahead at what Peter will say in his uh, Pentecost sermon after Jesus has ascended, the Holy Spirit is poured out. In Acts chapter 2, Verse 22, Peter will say, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Now listen to this. This Jesus, and here it is, delivered up, same word, handed over, it says. But listen, by who? According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Let me read it again. This Jesus delivered up, handed over, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. This is one of the most incredible truths about the gospel is, yes, human beings are responsible they were, they were responsible. There's personal responsibility in betraying Jesus, putting him on the cross, crucifying. But Jesus wanted his disciples to understand this was the plan of God. 
and it didn't catch God off guard. God didn't send his son to come down and be a good teacher and work miracles and, 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 and be the example of a perfect life and, and then, oh, something happened that God didn't see coming. People turned against him and they, ki- they, they arrested him, they put him on a cross and they crucified him. So God had to step in and raise him from the dead. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to live a life you and I couldn't live And he sent him to die a death that you and I should have died. That's the gospel, brothers and sisters. This is the God that we serve who intentionally, purposefully did this on our behalf. He did this for us. It wasn't an afterthought. God is sovereignly in control of this whole thing. Jesus wants his disciples to understand and know that. He doesn't want to get them to get caught off guard to think, oh, we didn't see this coming. And so he lets them know, I'm already being delivered up. I'm already being handed over. And ultimately, it is at the sovereign hand of the Father in heaven who is in pursuit. Listen to me. He is in pursuit of men, women, boys, and girls in order to save them. This is what God did for us. If I could just press pause there for a moment and say, any of you in the room or maybe watching online, who've never trusted Jesus Christ, I I want you to hear this gospel. And I want you to know that God did this for you, just like he did this for us. He came looking for you in the person of Jesus Christ. He came purposefully in Christ Jesus to pay the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. And no human being, no human being, No human being took that out of the control of God. This was his initiative because of his love for you. And our prayer is today, if you've never trusted him, if you've never repented of your sin, and you've never placed your faith, your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, please do that today. Please do that today. Believers come back into this conversation and Jesus continues, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And and when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. So so this is Jesus' message to his disciples. This is the lesson, this is the primary lesson. This is what he wants them to get. Here's his purpose. You know, all those times that he has he has guarded himself. You know, from from the the fever pitch crowd who just wanted him as a miracle worker, who just wanted him uh, for the sensational, just wanted him to do for them what they want to do. And he was, so he was telling people along the way, hey, don't tell anybody. You know, let's don't draw a crowd on this thing. Why? Because he knew there were so many people that would miss this. They would just want him for what he could do for them, and they wouldn't want him for what he came to do. And so what you see happening here now for the second of three times in three chapters, chapter 8 we saw it, we see it here in 9, we'll see it again in chapter 10, Jesus is giving the disciples the primary message of the gospel, and that is that he had come to die for the sins of the world, and in doing that he would rise from the grave to give people back the life of God. This is the message. But I want you to see something else here. I want you to see just a deposit of mercy that Jesus gives these disciples. Look at verse 32. But they did not understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Now, certainly, there is the idea here that all of us have experienced. Have you ever... You ever been in a conversation with somebody and, and they're saying stuff that, that is just, it, it's disturbing or it's pointing to something disturbing and, and you just don't want to deal with it. You, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to hear it. You, you might even in a conversation like that say, don't tell me anymore. I, I don't want to hear this. I can't deal with this right now. There, there's obviously an element of that, that, of that that is going on here in this passage of Scripture. 
The disciples are, they're beginning to hear, and Jesus has already said this now in chapter 8, now he's saying it again, he's talking about this dying stuff, that they still haven't fully embraced that as the mission of the Messiah, they're holding out hope that this is, man, this is a military political conquest, and so here's Jesus talking that crazy talk again, and they, they just don't want to deal with it, don't tell us anymore, it says here they were afraid to ask him about, it. there's no question that some of that is going on, but I think there's something else. There's something else that is going on in this passage of Scripture, and that is the reality that the disciples, the disciples are, they're actually being the recipients of some great compassion of our Lord. You know how we know that? We know it from Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, when, when, when Jesus teaches them and says this to them, it, it actually says, Luke tells us that, that Jesus was, he was, with, he, he was kind of closing their minds a little bit. He wasn't, he wasn't allowing them to completely see and understand. And we've got to understand that is what is going on right here. Why? Because it was something that was so overwhelming that their Messiah would actually die, that Jesus was protecting, he was guarding their faith. You know, you've done this with your kids. You do it with your grandkids. You know, we, 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 we think sometimes we want to know the future, but we really don't. Sometimes with our kids and our grandkids, we, we don't give them all the information of what's going on. Why? Because we know they're not able to handle it, right? We know that it, it could be more detrimental to them than it could be helpful to them. And so we might give them part of the information, but we don't get all of the information, give them all the information of what's going on. And that, that certainly is happening in this passage of Scripture. Jesus is showing mercy to these disciples. Now, we cannot separate verses 30 through 32 from what follows, but I want us to bridge there, Okay. I want to build a bridge there so that you understand how these things are connected to the conversations that happen next. So, so keep in mind what Jesus has just said. He has told them this story. And, and I want to ask you to hold a place in your Bible right here in Mark chapter 9. And I, and I want to take you to a couple of passages. These are not going to be on the screen. This is one of the reasons I want you to bring your Bibles. I want to encourage you to do that. I, I, I want to I encourage you to engage these studies and these encounters so that we hear the voice of God. So I'm asking you to do a little bit of work this morning, uh, and, and I want you to turn in your Bible to a couple of passages that I know many of you are familiar with. The first one is, is in John. It's in John's Gospel, chapter 13. So I want you to go over to John's Gospel in chapter 13 to the night before Jesus was crucified. We studied the Lord's Supper time ago when he, he transformed the Passover meal into communion. This is in John chapter 13, happened as part of that whole evening right there. And I'm thinking specifically about the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Okay, so you know, during that time, Jesus does the unthinkable. He, he takes a, a, a basin of water and he takes a towel and he kneels down and he does to his disciples what only, listen, what only the lowest of servants would do. And that's wash somebody else's feet. And he does that for his disciples. I want you to listen to his explanation John chapter 13, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. 
Truly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. What did Jesus just say? It's not rocket science. He says, what I did and what he was doing was a preview of what he was about to do with his whole body. When he went to the cross and died for the sins of the world, he gives them a preview of that. And in that preview, Jesus says, what I just did for you is the way that you are to treat one another. So there is a relationship, watch this, between what Jesus does and what we are to do. What Jesus did in his sacrifice, and listen, come in here real close, his servanthood, The Lord of Lord, the King of Kings, the Master of all, what he did in stooping to be a servant, he now says that's the economy that you are to live under. Let me show it to you again, Paul's writings. Keep going in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2. Again, another familiar passage to many of you. Philippians chapter 2. And we're just jumping in in the middle of this, the Apostle Paul writing to believers in the church at Philippi. And verse 3 is where I'll start reading. Look at what he says, Philippians 2, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. And I want you to listen to the words here, okay? Do nothing from selfish ambition and conceit, but in humility... Key word, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Count others more significant than yourself. I just want you to stop and think about how many times that simple thing doesn't happen. It, you know, if I could just take a small example and forgive me, forgive me if this is offensive to some of you. I pray we don't end up back where we were on this COVID thing, having to wear masks all the time and and all of that kind of thing. But could I just say to you that I have never observed more unchristian, gospel contrary attitudes in the Christian church than I have with this. Things that are contrary to that on all sides of the opinion of this. Hear the gospel and its application. This is what the word of God says. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition and conceit. I want my rights. I want to do what I want to do. This is about me. You, you see, you see. A, a minute ago when I started talking about the goat, most of us look at that and say, well, I, just like I said to you, I, I would never do that. I would never claim to be the greatest of all time. But, but I want you to think about it in terms like this. When we begin, we begin to impress what we want, our desires, our selfish attitudes, what we think are our rights on other Christian people, what are we doing? We're saying, I want to be the greatest. I want to be the greatest. And this is what Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, don't do Let each of you look, look at verse 4, not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. Now, why? Well, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You hear that? Which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Now, you understand, you understand the similarities between those two passages. One of them is a real-life account. Jesus is demonstrating it, washing his disciples' feet in view of what he's about to do on the cross. In other words, listen, watch this. The gospel, the gospel is something then that is to show up in the way that we treat one another in the way that we approach one another, in the way we respond to one another. This is what Jesus did. He was a, Paul comes back and says the same thing. You have the same mind. Take on the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, who he, though he was in the form of God, didn't consider, he didn't hold on to that. And he didn't claim it to say, I'm maintaining this right and I'm, maintain, and I'm not going anyplace else or doing anything. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. 
Beloved, listen, that is exactly what is happening in Mark chapter 9. That's exactly what's happening. And you see, I spent a lot of time talking about the mode of the gospel because, see, when you get that, the, the, these other two conversations are really pretty simple. Let me show you now how the motive of the gospel now impacts our understanding of the meaning of greatness. That's what you have beginning in verse 33. First thing that happens is we see Jesus make an inquiry of the disciples based upon what they obviously were talking about on the road. They went to a, came to Capernaum, went into the house. We don't know what house. Maybe Peter and Andrews, which had been kind of home base during the Galilean ministry, but it really doesn't matter. They're, they're, they're private. They're, they're, they're alone. And so Jesus asked them, what were you discussing on the way? That's his question. Now, Jesus didn't have to ask the question. He knew what they were discussing. It's like he always knew. He's sovereign. He's omniscient. But this is what a great teacher does. He draws out learning opportunities from his students. And that's what Jesus is doing. And the response to that inquiry is one of the greatest ironies in the Bible. Verse 34 says, They kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Now, I call that an irony. Why? Because of verses 30 through 32. Isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic that Jesus had just been teaching the disciples about the cross, about why he came to earth, about what his mission was, and that was a mission of sacrificing himself even to the point of death, being crucified, persecuted, handed over, arrested, persecuted, crucified on a cross. And then on the way to Capernaum, what are the disciples talking about? They're talking about who's the goat. <laughs> They're arguing about who's the goat. Look at Jesus' instruction, verse 35. He sat down. I mean, even in his position, there is, the, there is the demonstration of instruction. This is what rabbis did during this time. They would sit. Most of the time, everybody else would stand. It'd be just opposite of the way we're doing it here, and we do it in our culture. The speaker stands most of the time. The people sit down. Well, it was reversed then. So this is a statement. It's not just a description of what's going on. It's a statement that Jesus was about to teach them something really important. And what's the instruction he gives them? Verse 35, he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. We, we don't have to spend a lot of time with that in light of, of what we've just seen, in, in light of his teaching on the gospel. But it is a statement that's consistent with what Jesus did in basically turning the economy, listen to me, of the Christian life on its head. He did this in so many ways. I mean, think about it. He said, if you, if you want to be first, you've got to be what? You've got to be last, right? He said, if you, if you want to be a, a leader, you've got to be a, a what? You've got to be a servant, if you want to be, if you want to live, you got to, we, we just studied this, you got to what? You got to die, right? I mean, just think about how those things are kind of familiar to those of us who've read the Bible some and spent some time with it, but try to put yourself in that situation in a context, in a culture, both Roman culture, both Greco-Roman culture and Jewish culture. What was magnified was elevating yourself. This is why we're told that the scribes and Pharisees, they wore the phylacteries and the long robes and they loved the best places in the synagogues and they vied for position. And this is what was exalted even among the, 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 the Romans. The idea of humility, of humbling someone, you know, of, 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 of being last, of pursuing last, what, you know, what was just a total countercultural concept. And, and that's, that's what Jesus puts on the table here. Can you imagine 
Can you imagine? I, and I know it happens sometimes, and I don't see it, but just you know, go back to professional athletics or college athletics or just the athletic deals. Can you imagine interviewing somebody that had all the talent in the world that really could arguably be in the conversation about being the greatest of all time, and a reporter asking them, you know, what do you hope to accomplish this, you know, this, you know, this year? And instead of him saying, I'm going, to lead it, I'm going to lead the league in rushing, I'm going to lead the re- league in pass completions, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. Can you, can you imagine hearing someone say, I'm going to do everything I can this year to help my teammate score more touchdowns. I'm going to do everything I can this year to help th- this person on my team to be the one that you're interviewing at the end of the season instead of me. I'm going to do everything I can this year to help, help this player on my team get a better contract next year because he performs so well. You, you understand how foreign that is to thinking. But listen, beloved, it's, it's foreign to our thinking as well because it goes against our nature, and that's what Jesus is saying here. He's turning this, this, this whole economy of the Christian life upside down. If anyone would be first, let him be last of all and servant and all. And so they wouldn't miss it. He gives an illustration. Verse 36, took a child in his arm, picked him up, said in verse 37, who receives such a child in my name? Let me just stop right there and make sure we understand what's happening here. You've got to understand the difference between children and how they were perceived in that culture and children, how they're perceived as ours. You know, we, in our culture, and, and, and I'm not saying this is wrong. I think this is a good thing. You know, we celebrate kids. We, we magnify them, especially those of us who are grandparents, you know. We're putting my, look at my pictures, you know. I want you to see my grandkids, but we, we love our kids. And, and, and as a culture, we do things to protect them, at least after they're born, right? I mean, it's kind of, a, a, you know, an, an irony that we don't do it for the, the pre-born. But after they're born, when culture, society says they're legitimate now, which we know differently as believers in Christ, but, but in our culture for children, we, we protect them, we guard them from abuse, and we, we do everything we can to magnify them and pick them up. You've got to understand that wasn't the case in this culture. The mortality rate among children was, was, a, was a lot higher, and so they, they really didn't, didn't even put a lot of value until they knew a child was going to survive. They weren't considered the features in conversations, and, you know, in those days there were so many other things that were considered to be more important. In other words, children represented the lowest of the low. Uh, in the sense of their utter dependence uh, on somebody else to take care of them, being a, a, a lesser emphasis, being less important than the adults, and on and on you could go. And, and if you can kind of get your arms around that for a minute and then plug it back in here, you can see what Jesus is doing. He's picking the icon of something, someone that really isn't considered very important, doesn't have any status, is completely dependent upon other people, and, and basically is, is saying, this is what you need to be. Now, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says something a little bit in this account. He says something wrong. He says, unless you come to the kingdom of God like one of these children, you can't get in. And that's how you get saved, Right? It's not because you earn it or deserve it or I don't do anything good. It's because I come to a place where I realize I don't bring anything to the table. I got nothing here. And if Jesus doesn't do something for me, I'm, I'm, I'm in trouble. And, and, that, and that's how a person, and that's what Jesus was saying when he took this child. Here in Mark's gospel, notice what he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. In other words, the way you treat Watch it, church. The way you treat the lowest of the low is the way you treat Jesus. His words, not mine. Look at it. Whoever receives one such child in my name, in in, in view of the gospel, in view of what I stand for and what I came to do, what does that person do? They receive me. But then he takes it up a notch and says, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So basically, put these two together. Because of the gospel, 
because of what the gospel has done, that leads us to a different economy of greatness, a different meaning of greatness, and greatness in the kingdom. The kingdom goat, listen, is the person, is the person who responds to, reacts to, ministers to, receives the lowest of the low with this understanding, knowing that when we're doing that, we're really, that is really our attitude toward Jesus. And our attitude toward Jesus is reflective of our attitude toward God. Simple as that. That is the meaning of greatness. But Jesus isn't done. A new meaning of greatness, a different meaning of greatness leads to a ministry of graciousness. John, in verse 38, I, I, we, we don't know if he was under conviction or he's listening to what's going on. And, you know, so he, you know, he, he, he starts thinking about something else and he wants to ask about it. Well, we don't know that. Possibly Mark even just inserted this story here to make a point to his listeners. And that point will become very, very clear. But nonetheless, John, in verse 38, he makes an admission. And he says, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. And here it is. Notice at the end of verse 38, because he was not following us. He wasn't one of us. He wasn't part of our group. There is a, there is a uh, flavor of exclusivism here, okay? You know, there's something special about our group, and if you're not in our group, you're, you're not legitimate. You're not the real deal. Notice Jesus' admonition in verse 39. Don't stop him. Don't stop him. Now, before I read the rest of what he says, let me just put this in context for you, okay? Number one, this is not a statement that Jesus is about to make about the nature of salvation, and it is, it is something that he says in the context of persecution or the preparation for persecution. You have to understand those things. So what does he say? For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. Jesus is assuming the legitimacy of this person's heart condition that he really is. This is, he's not speaking about the sons of Sceva and others, you know, over in the book of Acts that just wanted the power and were looking for magical incantation. He's obviously talking about somebody that is doing a legitimate miracle and they're doing it for the legitimate right motives and that is the gospel. And he says a person that does that, can I mean, they, they wouldn't be able to turn around and talk bad about me afterwards. In other words, they would talk good of me. Verse 40, the one who is not against us is for us. It's just the opposite of what Jesus says at another point in the gospel, and that is where he says if somebody's not for us, they're against us. But he's talking about two different things, two different circumstances, two different settings. Here he's talking about in the midst of persecution, He's talking about when the heat is on, I'm going to go die and rise again. You're going to be left here. People are going to be coming against you. Mark's readers in Rome during this time that we're reading this were under intense persecution, and they would have understood this. They would have understood that there's people out there that were putting their lives on the line, even if it was in just not acknowledging you know, the Roman emperor as God, just not denying Christian friends. That person was putting their life on the line. And Jesus says, if one who's not against us is obviously for us. And then he says, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of you, because you belong to Christ, will by no means lose his reward. And he, he attaches onto it God's perspective on these people. Now, there's so much we could say about this. But let me just say to you, and <laughs> I don't want to just talk to you, Brainerd. Uh, I don't want to just talk to you, church. I, let, let me say something to you as Baptist, okay? I'll just take our, our denomination. We have a tendency, don't we? And I'm Baptist for a reason. I've got strong convictions about it. And I think they're spiritual convictions. But sometimes it's easy for us to think if somebody's not in our camp, they're not legitimate. And we've got to learn to make a distinction between essential doctrine and non-essential doctrine. You and I will break fellowship over issues like the inspiration of Scripture, like penal substitution, by, like salvation being in Christ alone by faith alone. We're not going to be able to hang, you know, really, uh, you know, in, in partnership over certain doctrine. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. 
He, he's talking about somebody that's doing ministry in my name with the right perspective of the gospel. He's talking about somebody who's not against us and obviously for us. He's talking about somebody that God would see and put his approval on. So there are some things that, that, we, that, that, that do separate us from a standpoint of fellowship. But you know what? I'm not going to argue with you. And, and we're not going to break fellowship on, over election and free will. You know, we, we may feel differently about that, but I'm not going to break fellowship over that. There going to be issues, uh, you know, maybe related to some of the ways and, or, 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 or perspectives with regard to the ordinances. It doesn't mean that we'll all be a part of the same church, but, but it does mean that I don't see myself as exclusive and having a corner on the market when it comes to non-essential doctrines. If we are advancing the gospel with a right understanding of the gospel and, and we are being gracious to one another, as we did, happens even within the church as well as across denominational lines. doesn't mean we're all on the same page about everything. It does mean that the gospel demands, because we have a different understanding of greatness, it does mean that the gospel demands that we extend graciousness to one another as believers in Jesus Christ, sometimes across denominational lines, sometimes across group lines. You see how these things are related together? The gospel is the motive. And because of the gospel, we have a different understanding of what it means to be great. And because we have a different understanding of what it means to be great, we extend graciousness to one another as believers in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, we bless you and we give you great praise. And we thank you for the gospel. It's been said that the gospel changes everything. We know it does. We acknowledge this morning, based upon your word, that it changes how we view greatness. Help us with that, Lord. That our pursuits, our values, our desires, our ambitions would be that that are driven by the gospel. And God, may that include, may that include defining how we treat one another, even, even when we have disagreements over non-essential issues. Pray for friends today that are wrestling with faith in Christ for the very first time. Give them courage and boldness. Pray today would be their spiritual birthday. Today would be the day you save someone and draw them to yourself. We pray for ourselves as well. That you would give us the mind of Christ that our lives would be shaped, be driven by this gospel that we embrace. Church, let me ask you to stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord through song before we go.
Bring and pray.